I have one obligation that means everything to me. When I made my vows, I told God that I was going to take care of this gift. This is my gift. And I was obligated to see after him and him alone. And whatever that meant, I was in it to win it. Mm. So when he couldn't eat, I didn't eat. Mm. When he couldn't drink, I would sneak and drink. But then God did a miraculous thing. Talk about it. The last treatment was our oldest granddaughter's wedding day. Teach. September the 17th. Mm. Of last year. And God healed him to the point that he could perform the wedding. And the tears, the crocodile tears came out of my eyes. I was celebrating her, but then I was celebrating God because he had brought him to such a wonderful place. I never imagined my public healing would inspire others to heal across the world. I thank you for using him to reach the world with the message of hope in relationships. But your life does not. God, you are my publicist. We laugh. We share the unadulterated truth. He said, not only have I not divorced you, I ain't exposed you. We didn't marry fans, we married forever. And we wanted forever to act like a fan. Reveal her, Jesus. I will not compromise Mm -mm. on getting a woman of God. You don't have to. And Father, I declare for his future wifey, thank you for preserving her. This season, I declare miracles and manifestations. See, you're selling scripts. And you're unique. You ain't like nobody else. I I noticed that right away. You being true to who you are, you're going to attract. It's a Hebrew word, chayil, and it was translated wealth, and it means people. It means men, it means resources, and it means means. I'm LaTaris R. Whitfield, and this is the Dear Future Wifey Podcast. Welcome to the Dear Future Wifey Podcast. I'm your host, LaTaris R. Whitfield. Listen, are you still shacking up with us? If you're still shacking up with us, why don't you hit that subscription button and subscribe? Make sure you turn on your notification bell so you'll be notified about upcoming episodes. If you're listening to us on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, or other streaming platforms, make sure that you leave a review and rate the podcast five stars if the streaming platform allows it. Man, uh, y'all have been pouring in with so much support. I am in good spirits. When y'all saw episode, the episode that I released last week, uh, Healing from Heartbreak, I mean, it, it, it touched so many people's lives. That was the fastest growing video on the Dear Future Wifey podcast. It hit 100,000 100, views in just three days, uh, and it's still climbing. And, you know, I just thank God for the ability to be vulnerable with the world. As y'all know, this podcast is my online journal as I discover, uncover, and recover love. And I've always said that I will always keep it lit where we live intentionally and transparently. And so that's that was the epitome of that um, in last week's episode. But see, God, in all his infinite wisdom, he had me uh, set up the perfect guest for today's episode. Um, I booked them like a month ago and God in his omniscience knew that this episode would come after instructing me to do the episode that I did last week. Uh, and y'all see why this episode is so important. So without further ado, welcome to the Dear Future Wifey podcast. My new homies, <laughs> the Griffins. How y'all doing? Bless, man. Bless. Wonderful. Glad to be here. Thank you so much for Wonderful. inviting us. Now, let me tell y'all. Now, I have y'all here for selfish reasons, all right? Okay. Um, this is my personal journey. And so I've always wanted a couple on the podcast who can pour into me. But I wanted a couple who has been married 40 plus years. Y'all have been married how many years? 51 years. 51 years. It'll be 52 years, August the 14th of this year. A lot of people may recognize y'all's face. Why would they recognize (laughs) y'all? Instagram. TikTok. TikTok. Facebook. And BET. BET. And the dark room. No, (laughs) no. He said the dark room. It's the shade room. (laughs) Jeez Louise. Sorry. It's the shade room. I have to tell you all a quick story about that. I'm uh, my my standard line is I took the 
a computer class, Computers for Dummies, and flunked it. <laughs> I am the least knowledgeable about technology. And so when my granddaughter told us that, uh, I, I interpreted it, all I heard was room, and I thought she was telling me we were in the dark room. <laughs> and so I started sharing with people, we're in the dark room, we're in the dark room. <laughs> And people looked at me like, I have no idea what you're talking about. And Hunter, our granddaughter, said, no, Grandpa, it's called the shade room. Right. So we're grateful for all of you who in the shade. No. <laughs> no. Well, I'm no. sorry. Oh, Jesus. We're grateful for those that have viewed our different social media that our granddaughter has, Hunter, has put us on. And we hope and we pray that we've been a blessing to those that have watched the videos. We are not rehearsed. Yeah. We just shoot it from the hip. Yeah. That's how we do it. You know, and that's what I love so much. I can resonate with y'all. We had a chance to break bread. We had breakfast today. Uh, so um, I asked y'all, what should I call you? Should I call you Linda? Uh, should I call you Ronald? You said, call me whatever. I said, no. Nah. I said, because I respect y'all. Y'all are pastors. And, you know, like, what What should I call you? You said, listen, just call me Grandpa and Grandma. Yeah. yeah. So I'm going to call y'all Grandpa and Grandma. We broke bread together, so we family. Absolutely. And so we're going to have fun. Uh, you told me earlier, uh, Grandpa, you said, listen, I want you, you have an open door to ask me whatever. Uh, one of the things that I find that is so powerful is that you wonder, how do people make it to 51 years of marriage? Marriage has been so disposable these days. Sure. Uh, that staying power uh, is just not seen as much in today's age. We People are divorced over the smallest things. Matter of fact, they made it so easy to divorce uh, where they call it irreconcilable differences. Right. Uh, that means whatever you decide that you couldn't reconcile that we can get a divorce over and unfortunately that's the option that I took when I filed for divorce seven years ago is irreconcilable differences and so as I go on this journey I said God I want to put people I want you to bring people on my podcast that could uh, challenge me that can pour into me so that when I do this thing again that I come with a database of information a database of wisdom uh, a database of an army of people who have come alongside of me to keep my arm lifted up when I want to get weary in my well-doing and hold me accountable to the vows that I will take. And so y'all are not here by happenstance. Y'all are here by special assignment to pour into my life. And so today's episode is entitled Unfailing Love. I love it. Unfailing Love. So, oh, Ronald, Grandpa. Yes, sir. How did you meet old Grandma over here? Oh, so, baby, tell the story. Here's tell the, the deal. story. <laughs> Um, I, I, I get you excited out, when he tells the story Ooh, baby <laughs> So I got out of the Air Force In 1969 after Serving uh, my nation and all that good stuff And I got Hired at Blue Cross Blue Shield of Michigan In downtown Detroit And she was working at a little boutique shop Between the building where I worked And the bar where I would Hang out during lunch Yeah and I was walking by one day, and she called me out. She spoke to me. And I said, hey, what's up? You know, because I was handling it, y'all understand. I, I was the man. I, I had more hair than I had, and I had a beautiful fro. I was slim. I was, you know, like. Dapper I was handling. Yeah, you were handling. Okay, handling. So, <laughs> you had your pick and, uh, of the litter, basically. That's what you're trying to say. a little bit. You had your pick of the litter. Oh, yeah. No question. <laughs> he had the whole litter. <laughs> So she asked me after I talked to her for a few minutes, would you like my phone number? And I told her, no, <laughs> I'll get back to you. And so a couple of days later, I walked by and she was sitting in the window of this boutique shop. Yeah. And that was back in the day that the women's style were hot pants. Okay. And I saw these purity legs. Now I know y'all all spiritual and everything like that. No, nah, my uh, people, my people is a, a, a my totally kind different of people. people. They everybody. Go, okay. Come well, on with the story. I saw I saw her legs and then I saw her, her eyes change colors even now. Uh the kind of hazel green with a little tint of brown. They, they were beautiful. And so I said, hey, let me kind of check this out a little bit. I got a little time. And one thing led to the other, but the, the turning point was we dated a little bit. But I went to Chicago on company business. Bruce Cross sent me to Chicago. 
And I was at the hotel. It was a convention. And some of my partners from the Air Force that I had been in the service with. And I called this girl every night. Now, I got an expense account. <laughs> I'm handling women everywhere. Yeah. And I said, I kept calling her. So in my convoluted sense of thinking, I said, I must really like her more than I realized. <laughs> I left Chicago, flew back to Detroit, went straight to the jeweler and got her ring just like that. Really? And told her, <laughs> let's get married. And then I went and asked her father, could I have a hand in marriage? And he just looked at me like he did often at that time. This boy is crazy. <laughs> and then when I went home to tell my mother and father they took one look at me and her and never stopped watching television because I had a habit of falling in love and bringing women by the house and telling them that he was going to marry the one. You, we said, got you, know, you had a habit of doing that? Yes. Uh-huh. We got married 10 months from the day that I met her in the face of the opposition of both of our families because at that time there was they thought the age difference and the background difference I was uh, 25 and she was 17. and uh, But 17 was a legal age to get married back then, or do you have to be 18? We, we didn't count legalities. We're not talking about that. <laughs> right. <now. laughs> right. right. <laughs> but I can tell you that neither one of our families were supportive, but we made up our mind that we were going to get married, <laughs> and that's what we did. And so I have to just tell you this is, is the second part of this. So... The day that we got married, you know, we have ushers, right? Yeah. Groomsmen. Yeah. I had two of my partners. They still my partners. They still alive, doing well. I had them stationed at the door. I said, and I gave them a list. If these show up, okay. Bar them. Do not let them come in because that was at a time when people say, is there any reason why these two people should not be joined in matrimony? They let them speak now or hereafter. And so I knew that they would have some... Some, Perhaps, some, some uh, bad words. They would be sharing some information was should not have been prevalent or relevant. <laughs> so they was watching out, and uh, that was uh, how we got together. It, it just was amazing to me, and uh, we just decided that uh, we're doing this. Uh, point <laughs> now you want to hear my version? Yes, I got to hear your version. Hold on. Because my version is out of sight. Talk to me. I saw him. He was fine. I claimed him. I put my... Hot pants on, <laughs> and I sat there across my legs, and I just waited. I said, "You want my number?" He said, "No, I don't want your number." I said, "Oh, he gonna want my number." <laughs> he was a challenge, <laughs> and ladies, you know, if it's a challenge, we always win. <laughs> always win. Still winning. Fifty-one years. Still winning. Still, Still winning. Winning. So I went after him up until we got married. No, about two months before he asked me to marry him, I had this boyfriend. This is when I knew I loved it. He wasn't nothing, y'all, but go ahead, baby. He was something. <laughs> Couldn't been too much. <laughs> I'm just saying. Okay. You, you're, you're over here. So, so, did you, so did you have the boyfriend when you was, when you was uh, shooting your shot at him? When you was crossing your legs? Absolutely. Had lots of them. <laughs> Had lots of boyfriends. Anyway, <laughs> the guy came to pick me up from work. And I promise you, he did not see him do what he did. He said, is that your friend? I said, yeah. He took me and did a Clark Gable, Cary Grant kiss. The one that you lean all the yeah, way down. Yeah. And then he walked away. I said, ooh. Who did wait. that? You did? I yeah. said, ooh. You did that to him? He did. <laughs> he did that in front of the boy that I liked. And I said, you know what? I love this dude. Because he got a whole lot of kahunas. I said, I love him. And from that moment to this. He has demonstrated his immense love for me. Yes. He'll fight a bear. Yeah. And I believe that he will kill the tiger. (laughs) Yeah. He's my he's my hero on earth. He's my earthly hero. And I don't think it's nothing he can't do. So you basically said if you see him in a fight with a bear, you need to go help the bear. 
Oh, that is his saying. How did you, you know serious? that? How did well, you know you, that? I, I, I keep know. telling you everything you say is a trigger because <laughs> as I was sharing with you in 2021, I was afflicted with third stage malignant cancer. Yeah. And uh, it took nearly four hours of surgery to remove the cancerous tumor. And it took 33 radiation treatments to finish. 33. 33. And my testimony, because uh, I'm a Church of God in Christ pastor, my testimony was God promised he was going to heal me. In fact, uh, they, they took an MRI and CAT scans to see if the cancer had spread. And the cancer had not spread. So the Lord said to me, Come on, talk about now it. payment on your healing. Mm. I didn't let the cancer spread. And so I started to testify. I told the people, I don't need a pity party prayer. If you see me in a fight with the bear, you pulled a honey on me and y'all helped the bear. I told, I, I, I told everybody that over and over. I got this. Woo. And so when you said that, that was mm. that was then and it is now my testimony. Mm. God promised that he was going. He said, you're going to go through. As a matter of fact, I forgot to tell you, I wrote a book called Force to Focus, and I brought you a copy. I Thank you. I'm going to sign it before we leave. Please do. But when you said that, that was my testimony. I was I, I made my boast in the Lord, like the scripture says. Made, made your boast. boast in the Lord. Yes, sir. <laughs> you was 10 toes down in the promises of God. Absolutely. See? So, And you were how old? 78. You're 78 now. How old were you when you when you were going through cancer? Uh, this is 70, what, 22? 76. 76. You were 76 when you was going through cancer? Oh, yes. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yes. Absolutely. It, it took... I lost close to 50 pounds. I got down to the size I was when I was discharged from the Air Force. Um, you could see the flesh hanging. Um, you know, all that you go through. I could not eat because of two reasons. One, it was the parotid gland. You have two, one on the left side and the right side of your face. That's what controls your saliva. You cannot eat without, okay? Yeah. So and and radiation for those cancer uh, uh, patients know what I'm talking about. It burns and there's a metallic taste, okay, because man was in my mouth. So therefore, when I tried to eat, and I didn't have the saliva from the gland, I would just gum it up. But it had that poison from the radiation, so therefore I couldn't swallow, okay. And so they tried everything. They tried protein drinks and milkshakes. And at one time, she was feeding me baby food. I couldn't eat anything. And some days, I couldn't even drink water. But God sustained me throughout all of that. And at no day was I ever sick. I just lost weight. I couldn't eat. But he told me in that process, teach. I'm going to teach you and show you about fasting. We go through all of these Contrived fast, you know, the right. Daniel fast, yeah. and a three-day fast, and a seven-day fast, and a 82-day fast, and <laughs> yeah. every other Monday fast, <laughs> and so on. He, I could not eat or drink. And, and and while I was taking the radiation, and the mask that had me bolted to the table, I said, I can't do this. And the Spirit of the Lord spoke to me and said, I'm forcing you to focus on me, because this is the only way you're going to get through. And when they would strap me down, I would go to praying. Oh, yes. Yeah, I would pray. I prayed every, I prayed before I would go in there, pray while they was shooting yes. that radiation and would pray and thank him. And she was with me every single day, every day. And she tried everything to feed me and it just, I, I couldn't ingest it. That's why even the breakfast today, if you heard me say, I thank you for the desire to eat, the ability to taste and to digest food. You sure did say that. Because nobody prays like that because you take it for granted. You bless the food, but I it's a, it's a blessing that I have a desire to eat mm. and the ability to taste and to digest food. Okay. So that's uh that's what you get, man. You trigger I, even <sighs> while we were at breakfast, he was saying so many things, man, and, and it just causes us to reflect uh she, she, my wife, this beautiful woman, I like to tell, the grandkids hate me to say this, uh, uh, and particularly my daughter. Uh, I'll say, well, that's my woman. Yeah. Okay, I want y'all to know that. Uh, <laughs> uh, but she, 
she absolutely <laughs> practiced her marriage vows, which yeah. says in sickness and in health. Yes. Uh, she was she was absolutely uh, right there every day, all day, and went through this. It was tougher on her than it was for me. Explain that. Explain that, uh, Grandma Linda. Because it was an emotional pull on my heart. Anybody that you love, I mean, you truly love, it concerns you, and you pain more than they pain. Yeah. And I watched him, so it came to the point that he couldn't eat, so I stopped eating. And I knew that I had to have some substance, but I would refuse to cook because I said if I cook, he'll smell the food. And I didn't want to cook and have him not be able to eat. So I would go in the kitchen and I would get a wrap and I would put a piece of meat in it and I would just eat that. I never fried chicken. I never, because that's a selfish thing. Gosh. When you can't put yourself on hold. I lost 20 pounds in the process of him losing 50. Because mm. you know women... We can't lose it quite as fast as the men, <laughs> right? And so when I would go to the treatments with him, I just watch it. And he was such a soldier. No matter what they did, they didn't break it. Yes. And because they didn't break it, my heart was broken every time they gave him the radiation treatment. Five days a week. I took him to the cancer in Zion, Illinois, the Cancer Treatment Center. I said, please tell me it's going to be different than what the VA diagnosed him as. But the diagnosis matched. They said the same thing. He's going to have to have the radiation. So I said to my children and my grandchildren, I won't be around. I said to the church, I can't be there. I have one obligation that means everything to me. When I made my vows, I told God that I was going to take care of this gift. This is my gift. Oh, and I was obligated to see after him and him alone. And whatever that meant, I was in it to win it. Mm. So when he couldn't eat, I didn't eat. Mm. When he couldn't drink, I would sneak and drink. But then God did a miraculous thing. Talk about it. The last treatment was our oldest granddaughter's wedding day. Teach. September the 17th. Mm. Of last year. And God healed him to the point that he could perform the wedding. And the tears, the crocodile tears came out of my eyes. I was celebrating her. But then I was celebrating God because he had brought him to such a wonderful place. So my tolerance for foolishness went out the window with mm. his cancer. So now it's he and I against the world. Talk about it. The entire world. Talk about so it. I, let me tell this story. You're going to love this. So we at the Cancer Center of America in uh, Zion, Illinois. It's about an hour drive north of Chicago. So there's a battery of tests and experts and doctors. And so one was with the psychiatrist because they're concerned about your mental yeah. faculties. And so I was letting them know about my faith and all of that, you know. And, and the doctor, you know, the psychiatrist, she said, this is amazing. You need to talk. Right. And man, the Lord began to anoint me. So when she got through, we had to wait for another doctor. And I was right out there in the waiting room. Jesus. And I started, you know, the, the Spirit of the Lord came and I went to praising God and speaking in tongue. And she said, honey... I said, now she you better said, stop that. With all of these, you know, I these said, people. I said, now what's going to happen? She said, they're going to lock us. She said, they're going to put, put you away. No, not lock us. Right. They're going to put you away. This is true. And she then said, I'm going to be out here watching them take you to the paddy wagon. I said, you better stop raising your hands talking about thank you, Jesus. I said, no, this is not the place to do that. That's true. Man, I said, would you please stop all of that? Please stop all of that. 
I said, because, you know, that is a for real doctor and a shrink. They go going to have the. Nobody has third stage cancer and, and go to shy. praising God. Praise no. God. So it was, it then was we started more. laughing and the doctor came out. She said, oh, what? And I said, oh, we're just. We're, we're just, just having just fellowship play. together. So that's I said, that. Yeah, you we had a what? lot of episodes like that. Oh, man. <laughs> Oh, you don't want, want to get locked up on Grandpa oh, Ronald? Right. No, Grandpa Ronald was not going to have Grandpa, uh, Grandma Linda watching him go because I was going to let him go because I couldn't go and defend him. I said, stop what you're doing. They were speaking in tongues. They'd be like, what yeah, is he, he saying? Yeah, he was doing all that in that lobby. Just like we sitting here. That's how he was going on. I said, it's way too much. You're doing too much right now. Doing too much. He tried to get a breakthrough. Your sense of humor. I don't care what you're going through in Mm-mm. life. Never Mm-mm. ever lose your sense of humor. Teach. Never lose it. Teach. Okay. And Teach. no matter what it looks like, there's always a tomorrow. Ah. When we were going through the cancer, it looked like we would never, ever, ever survive it. But there is something miraculous about no matter what you have to deal with, no matter how severe it is, if you trust not only in God, but if you trust in each other, you're each other's best support system. So he was down, I was up. Every day I got dressed as if I was going someplace really, really elegant. I would put on pearls every day or some type of jewelry. And I would always put on earrings, and then I would have matching uh, masks because that was during the COVID end. Yes. So I would always make sure that I looked beautiful for him Mm. so that when he came out of the treatment room, he would see something beautiful. And I told him, no matter what we got to do, we're going to go through it together. (sighs) And at the end of the day, there was a sunshine that came. Because God is a promise keeper. Teach. Don't mean that he's going to take it away. But what he says to us is that no matter what you're going through, I'm going to be right there with you. Yes. And on the other side of your illness, on the other side of your pain, I'll be there to wrap my arms around you. The young lady said, the text said, oh, what good hugs you give. Yes, Rihanna. The hugs came. Out of hurt. You can't hug somebody if you've never been hurt. But when you've been hurt, you know how to hug. And that hug that I give is one of sincerity. And when I hug, that pain eases that the person carries. So just know that this is my best friend. Oh, and we do have intense moments of fellowship. Don't we talked you? about. Come Ooh. on, we, 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 what are intense moments of fellowship? That's another word for what? Ooh, fight. <laughs> yeah, I was trying a to fight. Good fight. Yeah, we just, you know, a we're good human. Fight. So a good one. <laughs> she said, I good can one. tell you, as perfect as I believe that I am, see, <laughs> see, there are times wrong. that I get on wrong. my last nerve. There's times that. you don't know why. You don't know why that happens, do you? Uh, it's really a mystery. <laughs> And so uh, she'll do things, and she knows that it it aggravates me. So uh, we discuss things, and sometimes, you know, it's like I'm not paying any more attention to you. Don't worry about it. Okay? (laughs) And so we go at it. I I was just telling, uh, we had the conversation, we were just saying, uh, just recently. Yeah, on on New Year's Eve. New Year's Year's Eve. New Year's Eve. Right. So my granddaughter, Hunter, wanted us to do one of them little videos to send out. And she, you know, come on, Grandpa, you know, sit down with Grandma you know, and tell everybody thank you and all that. I said, I don't feel like that because she had really angered me <laughs> because of a little situation. Oh. And she was wrong and she wasn't willing to apologize. You you okay. know what? Okay. So I wasn't sitting down. I didn't feel like sitting next to her looking all goo-goo and I'm, oh, baby, I love you. Because I didn't like her like that at that moment. Because Hunter, who's in the studio right now, shout out to Hunter. Um, that's your grandbaby. She said that she wants y'all to record a video. She wants y'all to look into each other's eyes yes. and do what? And just look at. Oh, baby. Oh. We've made it through See? the whole year. Oh. I, uh, it was just way over the top. 
so I, I'm not I gonna you. do it because I was mad <laughs> and I was looking like really Hunter <laughs> you want me to do what now and so I looked at him and we were supposed to say happy new year <laughs> and he refused to say happy new year <laughs> And even thinking about it is making me angry right now. <laughs> so Hunter finally did this. She gave me that look like, okay, let's do this and then we'll settle this later. We go, you know how you do as a parent? Hunter became the parent. She said, we're going to all say it together. One, two, three. And he, we, I said, Happy New Year. And I just kind of acknowledged it. So we got through that. And this is something that you can only do when you've got the experience <laughs> of allowing the enemy to infiltrate your life yes. and you reject him. So the next day, I brought the subject up again mm-hmm. because she said, but you're supposed to let it go. <laughs> you know, and I told her, I, today I'm not into like the forgive and forget spirit. Okay, I'm in the spirit of holding know, on. I was offended. <laughs> Mm-hmm. So after we chewed it up a while, and then we got a little something that we do. Mm-hmm. Whichever one is wrong, mm-hmm. yeah, the other will say, "Are you sorry? Are you sorry?" Okay. <laughs> so that's 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 how to, that's the icebreaker. But well, listen at this, ladies. <laughs> listen at this. This is a smart, gray-eyed woman that is sitting here next to him. He thought, I said, "Oh." Oh, baby. Oh, baby. I'm so sorry. Because I wanted to go shopping. (laughs) I don't work. I'm retired. (laughs) And all things flow from his pocket. (laughs) Brothers. Let me tell you. We're nearly nearly as slick and smart as we think we are. But you learn how to work it. And let me tell you how Pick you do this. Pick your fights, lady. Let me tell you. The way it works for us, she tweets, treats me oh, like God. a king. Yes. I do. Okay. And so what I do is I create an environment yes, sir. that's conducive for her to feel like a queen. Teach. Yes, sir. Teach. I give her anything she wants. Teach. Because I trust her. Yes. Okay. And then she reciprocates. Yes, sir. So we spend our time trying to bless each other. Talk. Okay. That's what we do. Yes. We didn't get here overnight. We're talking 51 years. Yeah. Yeah. And so you go through the trials Mm -hmm. and the tribulations of trial by error. Uh, There was a time that she got an attorney for a divorce. What what year was that? Okay. I'm sorry. What year was that? Uh, Around our 20th year. Y'all was married for 20 years, and she wanted to say deuces and go. Absolutely. Ooh. Now, I was not. <laughs> ooh. Ooh. The but, Lord had but not hold, completely. Hold, hold this story. Hold mm-hmm. this story. He wasn't the mild-mannered reporter. <laughs> reporter. Yeah. He, he reported. He, he's a mild-mannered reporter today. <laughs> but 31 years ago, that fro he talked about <laughs> was still there, and he hadn't quite gotten all the way with the Lord. So. Well, uh, brothers. Uh, <laughs> what I told her is this. If you, and, and, and I don't, I'm not a racist. I hope I, I need to say that. But I said to her, if it's, if it's, it's a, a white process server, you go see about it on the six o'clock news. Because, you know, I was kind of carrying then. And I said, I don't, if he embarrasses me publicly, it's going to be over. <laughs> and I can tell you how God did this. He did do it. I never, ever got served publicly. Mm-mm. Never did. And then uh, my late sister-in-law knew my spirit because I was going to leave the house. Because she knew if I left, I would never return. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I went and lived in the basement of our house. Uh, while we were going through, and then the Lord spoke to her. Me. Spoke to her <laughs> and told her, you go get him. Go get him. Really? Mm-hmm. He humbled her spirit. I thought it was a human being in my bedroom. He said, go get him. And I looked around and was nobody there. It's true. 
but this is prior to him becoming a pastor. Yeah. And so our destiny of what we were going to become was going to be hampered by the mistake of divorce. Because if we had divorced, then my des- our destiny would have never been realized. Not with each other. He probably would have married again. I might have married again. But that was not the destiny that God had ordained for us. So when God spoke to me, I immediately answered the call and got him out of the basement. And I cried. He cried. And no, we didn't have a counselor. We had each other. Mm. And we had God as our ultimate counselor yes. and advisor. But you know what we did, too? You need to know this. We started going for long walks. Long walks. And we made an agreement that no matter what it, the issue was, we had to talk it out then. Don't let it fester. Don't let it build up. So we would be walking. And one of the things that bothered her about me was I had a very lackadaisical attitude toward paying bills. Absolutely. So, <laughs> you know, the bill collector would call, and I, I learned their names. You know, uh-uh. They knew say, each How you doing? How How's you doing? Going? Hi, Bill. How are you? Yeah. And so, Hi, Ron. How sometimes are you? Sometimes we were struggling. Sometimes I wrote checks that I knew would bounce. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And send them to us. So by the time then, they don't have the technology to do now, it would take three days or longer. Yeah. And they would call me and say, well, Mr. Griffin, uh, it showed up not sufficient for us. I said, oh, my God. I'll fix that. Okay. And so that but was by a, then that was we a, had a the oil. Yeah. block to her. Yeah. So, brothers, I said, if that's important to you, here's the paycheck. Because mm-hmm. I trusted her. Yeah. I knew she would take care of business. And I gave her the paycheck. Now, you pay the bills. Now, what else we got to talk about? Good. So we would go long Good. walks and fuss about it and talk it through. But we never let it fester, so it never became an issue, never became an unsolvable. When people talk about irreconcilable differences, that That's means right. you have eliminated God out of the process. Okay, trust in the Lord with all thine heart, lean not to thine own understanding, and all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct our path. You better teach. Yeah, so it, yeah. Was, it was important, and we did this. And by the end of the walk, uh, all of the emotion of anger would be subsided would even if we hadn't reconciled the difference. But we would stop fussing. And and uh, the, the Bible lets us know, be ye angry, but sin not. Don't let the sun set on your wrath. That's so right. we didn't go to bed angry. We had another thing in our fam- in our relationship, in our this families. marriage. If you leave the house in anger mm-hmm. and spend a night anywhere else, it's over. Yeah, mm-hmm. Stay here and work this yes. thing out. And that's what we did. And, you know... Uh, I can tell you this. I can I can promise you this. You absolutely defeat the enemy when you pause for a moment and think and say, "Lord, help us." Help us. You gotta ask him to come help you because you can't fix yourself. Okay, mm-hmm. but you got to say to him, "Lord, I need your help." And so we would do that. And uh, now the arguments. And, and moments of intense fellowship that we have now. I love that. Mostly, uh, we'll laugh when it's all over. Yes. You know? Then, because we didn't understand. And I want to let you all know this from the bottom of my heart. Love is not the most important thing. Mm-mm. Love is a byproduct of first, trust and respect. That's right. You build your love on trust and respect. We get it opposite. And so when you do that, flesh becomes... Uh, your measurement, right. you know, uh, he's handsome, she's fine, uh, the sex is good, all of that. But then when it comes down to trust and respect, you don't have a foundation. So then it unravels. So we built trust and respect and the love grew and grew. And then once you get that spirit of love in you, there's nothing on the face of this earth that I don't do for her. It's not a chore. It's not a job. Mm-mm. It's a pleasure because she's everything to me. When she had her time that I had to see about her, she fell down the steps 
and almost severed her ankle. Mm. And so our granddaughters would come and see about her during the day, but all of them said, Grandpa, we're tired, and they would go to bed. So I would stay up at night. Uh, I would help her to go to the bathroom. You know, it, she did, I, and when she slept, I slept. When she was awake, I was awake. And I walked her through that process. When she couldn't walk down the steps, I would show her how to sit down and scoot like a baby one step. Talk about it. God, we did do it. Yes. When you love, talk truly have it. I'm not talking about this foolishness in in the people of Mississippi, the people of Georgia, the the uh, uh, women of wherever they are. All that that's staged. Okay. <laughs> I'm talking about. Oh, you when, trying to say Housewives of Atlanta? You, you know what that's. That's what I'm trying yeah, to say. Yeah, that's what I'm trying to say. Yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah. Uh, he said women of Georgia. I was like, I'm following you, Pastor. All right, keep going, keep going. <laughs> so, all that stuff is staged, staged. When you go through things that are behind that, that people don't see, mm-hmm. you know, uh, that's when your love kicks in. That's when the love of Christ kicks in. So when I saw what she was going through, every time I looked at those steps. Even today, I tell her, turn the light on. Don't carry stuff in your hand. You don't want to see a loved one hurt, and you don't ever want to hurt the one you love. Talk about it. You can't do it. And so we've worked on this and worked on this and worked on this, and you don't ever stop working on it. Let me ask you this. When did y'all first meet adversity in y'all's marriage? Because y'all met adversity even Getting married, did your friends and family, or did your did y'all's family come to the actual wedding? See, you always do See? trigger. So, <laughs> I, let me tell you what I told <sighs> my family. I told them you don't have to come. I love my mother, I loved all of them. I said, but you don't have to come because I'm gonna marry her. Okay, and they weren't in support because of the age difference. And not only that, they had already pre-selected a woman for him. Uh huh. Well. The daughter of Be the, their best friend. <laughs> Stop. It's 51 years later. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. And, a, and ooh, you would, ooh. That's triggering you ooh, now, huh? Ooh. <laughs> I, you know, I see, look, look at you. But, but <laughs> they already had the woman selected. Yes. And then I came along, fine. <laughs> Tell them again. I was fine. There it is. In my hot pants. <laughs> And I made every all the bells and whistles went off when we were together. <laughs> so that's where the adversity came. Yeah, that was just one. Well, and then he, uh, I hadn't gone to college yet, <clears throat> and I was I was in high school. What do you mean yet? I was in high school. I was seventeen. <laughs> now you know I didn't have no business with no twenty five year old. But he was so fine, I said, forget the prom. You my prom. <laughs> Our prom going to be a wedding. <laughs> right. Exactly right. When I put on a nice fancy dress, it's going to be our wedding. What? Forget this. That's like, right. Like, I'm already, this is above me now. I'm, <laughs> you know, I'm not doing. Me. Yeah, it's below me. <laughs> I'm going to something higher. <laughs> we faced adversity when she lost our first child. Yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah. Um, what year? What year in marriage was this? First, first year. First year? Mm-hmm. Sec- no. No, it was a couple of years later. Uh, it wasn't the first year. Uh, well, I guess it was. It was the first yes, it year. was. And so I had never experienced anything like that. So understanding I cried. the emotions mm-hmm. and all of that. And that's why I say to young women, you hurt today, but just hold on. Sunshine is coming. Yeah. And then I had a nine pound, 13 ounce boy. Big baby. And he was so big that he didn't fit in the little bassinet. They had to go and get a a big one. And I said, I did that. (laughs) I was like, unbelievable. (laughs) But the adversity gave us closeness. Yes. And then it was seven years later, and then I had that beautiful little girl. So I couldn't have seen the beautiful son and the girl if I had been hung up with that one blurb. Yeah, I have a story about that, too. Teach. So 
but Ronald is his name. So she was out of it because of, you know, the birth. And so I went to the hospital. Four days in labor. Yeah. Four it's, days? Yeah, Four days. Yeah. And, and you know, they, they have a little wristband. And when I went there, um, she had decided that his name was going to be Jason Eric. So when I went, and she was still out of it, and I saw this bouncing baby boy, I said, we may not have any look, more children, so he can't be Jason pr- Eric. Look, his so, pride kicked in. So I named him. So when she came to. Out of the coma. She had, it wasn't just male mm-hmm. Griffin, it had this it, name. It had a name. Ronald Hunter Griffin. So she went off on the nurses. She said, how dare you all? You don't have no authority to name my child. Well, she would. She just wrecked the place. And they said, Mrs. Griffin, no, we no. didn't do that. We didn't do it. While you were out, your husband came in. So Who <laughs> does that? Back, Who does that? Right. <laughs> So that's that. That was true because so I, who I does, who does that? A, who does mm-hmm. that? Who does that to right. somebody who was in a coma after a baby was born? Who does that? Yeah. Get the that finance, camera. Financial <sighs> situations. Uh, so uh, you talking about adversity that y'all met at the beginning with? And so you look at financial financial from what perspective? Break we it down for the house. Views. We we mm-hmm. had a nice little bungalow. He said it bungalow. Was, we, we Initially, a, yeah, we bought a big house. Okay, uh, what's the name? It's the style? Uh, Colonial. Colonial. Yeah. The mortgage was twice as large as the one we previously had. Oh. Two and a half times. And well. then we had our daughter, but I had to keep the house warm, mm-hmm. and we had we had forced air oil heat. Wow. Mm-hmm. And it took as much money to heat that house, as the, large as it was, as it did to pay the mortgage. And she wasn't working. It was like 4,000 okay. square feet or something. Wow. Crazy. So that, that we just didn't have it. Yeah. And uh, I did what I was supposed to do. Mm-hmm. Um, the oil company knew us. Mm-hmm. So I, didn't, I just wrote them bad checks because I couldn't <laughs> have my, that was that. <laughs> And the next time they came, I would give them cash. Yeah. But when I couldn't reach them, I bought five gallon cans and I would go to the gas station. It was called K2. Uh, it's keros- like a kerosene. Mm-hmm. And I would fill them up and come back and I learned how to prime the pump. Teach. You know, to keep the house warm. So it was real, real, tight. real tight when it came, you know. And when it's like that, you need to know that when you need money, you can almost never get it. Yep. Banks will not loan you a dime. Yep. But yep. when you go when you don't need it, they'll give you a line of credit. Yep. And so it was a it was a real struggle mm-hmm. uh, while she was home taking care of the, of the kids and and all of that. We went through that several years before. Oh God. Uh, I, st- I got a couple of promotions on the job. She went back to work. Several and, years as in what? Quantify the time. Three years, four years, five? Uh, probably three years About of three. just absolute torment. So how was y'all relationship going on in that three years? Were y'all? Interestingly, it was strong. It was good. Because I kept providing the basics. Yeah. You know? And then when he wasn't able to do more than the basics. Right. I had a mama and I had a daddy. And my dad I'm a dad I was a daddy's girl. Mm-hmm. So my daddy would stop by and he'd come for breakfast. And he'd take a look and listen and he'd watch. But my daddy one time came to the house and I had prayed and I told God, I said I had some bills that I had to pay. And my dad said that God sent him to my house. And he pulled out his retirement check. And he signed the back of it. And when I turned it over, it was the exact money that I needed to pay my bills. And I told my daddy, I said, you couldn't have known. I said, who who told you? He said, God told me to come. 
So our parents, his mom and his dad and my mom and my dad would come and supplement when it was tight, tight. And we never had to tell them that it was tight. They just intuitively knew that it was tight. Mm, That's good. And so we had good family support on both sides. And then when I was able to go back to work, I was a junior executive at a big company, and I was so excited. I had a little office. I didn't have a corner office. I had an office, though, with big windows. Mm. I was so proud of where I had uh, gotten to, and I told my husband, I said, I'm interviewing for a new job. I was going to work for the airline. He told me, you're not going to interview for nobody. (laughs) I said, well, honey, I've kind of interviewed already. (laughs) I got the job. And he told me, I don't care what you got. You're not going to work. I won't even name the airline. He said, you're not going to work at the airlines and be a hostess, a reservation. No, what was it? it? They it was call a, them uh, a flight steward. attendants now. Flight yes, the flight stewards. They, 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 Stewardess. They, yeah, that's what I was going to be. Yeah. And I was so excited. I was so proud of myself. He told me, he said, you got two children and you got a responsibility here. If you're traveling, who's going to take care of your children? So I said, okay, not a problem. So I stayed at Bendix. And I stayed there until my daughter told me. She was six years old. She said, Mom, I don't know who you are. I said, what do you mean? She said, oh, I know who you are. You're the lady that bring home the packages from your travels. That's who you are. But my dad takes me to my dance recital. It's my dad that does this. My dad that does that. I don't know who you are. I went to work. I talked to the boss, my boss. He he said, I can't let you go. I need you. I talked to his boss. He said, you're not a part of the reduction in force. I t- took it all the way up to the vice president. And when God is in anything, he will make a way. They gave me severance pay. They let me come home. And retire from Bendix, huge corporation. They paid me. They let me come home. And there was no black mark on my my name. Because my daughter said she needed My son didn't need me. but my And I said on the outside chance that I lose her. Because of my selfishness of wanting to go up the corporate ladder. If I lose her, what have I gained? God, dog. So I quit that job. I came home and worked for a funeral home of all places. For 20 years, I worked for the funeral home because I was able to take her with me, sit her in my office. She could do her homework. I could pick her up in the middle of the day. And I, my son, I took him down in the basement of the funeral home and let him see what happens when you live a fast life. And I showed him the back of the heads of the people that had had their brains blown out. Wow, he Be- saw that. Oh, At yeah. what age? He was uh, about 15. Wow. But it, in the city of Detroit, he needed to see Oh, that. yeah, he needed to. And I said, this is what happens when you get in the fast lane. He subsequently went to college. He's a police officer. He uh, retired as a police trainer at the academy. But a long story short, he and I have had a multiplicity of challenges. But no matter what the challenge, we faced it and we faced it together. No matter the hurt, we talked it through. How did y'all overcome that 20-year, uh, normally people hit it, it's called the seven-year itch, where they face divorce, most of them fall, most marriages fail at the seven-year mark. 
uh, y'all hit y'all's at the 20 mm-hmm. where y'all about to file for divorce what most people say now y'all was with each other for 20 years now y'all overcame a whole lot of stuff y'all y'all lost y'all's firstborn y'all started off the relationship where all y'all's parents weren't in total agreement y'all overcame that you overcame financial issues and home situations and parents chipping in and paying for the um the Money that wasn't there that right, helped right. subsidize y'all. Yeah, buying groceries and doing all that type of stuff. Y'all overcame the situation of you wanting to climb up the corporate ladder to the tune of wanting to be a stewardess and mm-hmm. be away from your whole family uh, most of the week. Y'all overcame that. How do you get to year 20 and want to call it quits? And that was initiated by you. It's interesting because in today's day and age, 80 to 85 percent of divorces are initiated by women. It's interesting that you wanted to do that 31 years ago. So what did you face 31 years ago where you said, I'm done? She she faced my complacency. Mm-hmm. Like, this is cool. I don't need to work anymore at loving her. I don't want to work I don't need to work anymore at making her feel important. I don't need to work anymore at making her feel respected. I, I don't. She she has desires and visions and dreams, uh, but I don't have to be concerned about that because she's there every day. Mm. And so it reached the perfect storm. And when she finally just said, "I've had enough," see, people have to. You have to understand that we change. And so she had studied in Europe, studied in in Fran- in Paris, France, and. And so she's now, okay, I've been exposed to some things, and uh, I got I got some things I want to make happen. Oh, girl, don't worry about that. It kept on moving. And pretty soon it got to a place like, you're not hearing me. You're not paying any attention to me. Uh, and I'm unfulfilled. I'm unappreciated. Mm. I'm disrespected. So let me get out of this. And, and so that's what happens. Uh, it happens at different times in marriages. Yeah. And so we, what we have learned is, once she told me all of that, I said, well, why didn't you tell me? Well, I sent you signals, but you ignored them. Yeah. That's when I told you we started doing those walks and talking. Yeah. Because mm-hmm. some of the stuff she identified, I said, girl, that ain't important. I could make that happen. Why didn't you mm-hmm. tell me? Well, you weren't listening. And mm-hmm. so uh, we got to that. And then the timing of it, as she stated earlier, I didn't know at that time that the Lord was going to call me to become a pastor, okay? And so the enemy was working to make sure that the will of the Lord would would not be followed in... in, in, uh, Our destiny. uh, Mm. Yeah, and so when Mm. that happened, it changed our lives. It, It really, brothers, I say this to we as black men, we got to understand that our women have needs. Yes. Okay. Mm-hmm. It took nothing. It took, excuse me, it took nothing, and it takes nothing from me. She's smart. Shame on us, man. I, I'm glad my wife is smart. Yes. In fact, mm-hmm. in fact, I've told her for years, you're smarter than I am. Yeah. I just know how to get some stuff done. Uh, and so, but you're part of me. So when you when you disparage your wife, man, that's on you. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And so I'll give you an example. Uh, when she gained weight, I, I didn't I didn't talk about the fact. Look at you! Mm-mm. I told her go buy some bigger, bigger clothes. clothes. Okay. <laughs> he did tell me that. Yeah, and get hey, them you know, he said, "Get them tailored. Let them look good yeah, on you. Don't, ever, don't wear stuff that make people say, Ooh, that girl done gained some weight.' Okay. And you so, say go get some bigger clothes. And let's tailor them. Right. And he her. said, if you don't want to have any children, that's okay. Or have ten. Or to have ten. Doesn't matter." But be yourself. And so that's evolutionary. Mm-hmm. You have to work at this, but you got to acknowledge it. You got to acknowledge it. And so once I acknowledge that this girl got some more stuff she wanted to do, it was not in conflict because when I went back to school or to get my bachelor's degree from Wayne State University, I would write my papers. I couldn't type. Well, she would do all my report, all of that. So when it came time for her to go back to school after being a grandmother, then, as I was, we were sharing earlier, I made sure she had to go one semester. She was talking about how difficult it was to park. I said, you'll never have to park again. I drove her to every class those last two years, every assignment, every project. And some nights, I didn't feel like driving all the way back home. I would sit in the parking lot. And sleep. While she was in school. Yeah, man. It just, uh, especially in the wintertime. And uh, so we just did things uh, then so that 
what happened in 20 years would never happen again. Teach. Okay. Yeah. Teach, yeah, yeah. reverse engineer that yeah. thing and fix it at the root. Fix it. Yeah. Fix it. But that only comes with that staying power because what happens is most people throw in the towel before it even gets to that point to see right. the joy that cometh in the morning. Yeah. yeah. You know, they they give up on the weeping may endure for a night moment. But there's a caveat to that story that says, or that scripture that says, but Joy comes in the morning. Right. And so they give up too soon. And that's what's so inspiring that you said y'all made it to your destiny. Why do you feel that pastoralship was the destiny? Well, I got a lot of stories, you all. So a whole bunch. I will tell you this people. one. All true. <laughs> um, prior, several years prior to when I confessed uh, my Lord Jesus, my personal Savior, I got saved. I was at a party, some of my friends, my best friend, and and I would remember dancing with this young lady, and I was drinking, my favorite drink at that time was cognac, okay, uh, Remy Martin, uh, people at Remy Martin, I, I can't advertise for you now, I'm drinking water, and so <laughs> I told the lady, I told the lady, I'm a little off, and so. But you're good off. I told her, I said, the Lord is not going to allow me to continue to live this kind of life. That's right. And she looked at me and I said, he's going to save me. He's going to sanctify me, fill me with his precious gift of the Holy Ghost. You and said that. Fill you with the precious gift of the Holy while Ghost. He, yeah. While he's dancing with her. And, and, yeah. and drinking cognac. And I, and I said more. And I said, I'm going to do a great work for the Lord before he calls me home. Mm-hmm. And you were, how old were you, how old were you when you said that? I got saved in 1983, May the 9th, 1983, and I was 33. So I was about 30 years old, 31 or 32 years old, right in that period of time. And so, because I knew, I knew this, I knew that God had a greater plan for me. Okay. I didn't think about pastoring, but I knew he had a greater plan. And so as things unfolded, Okay, then it started to become a little clearer. And we both came to understand, even a very close personal friend, a young lady, realized, I think we had been married, what, about 40 years then? Mm -hmm. She understood that for the plan that God had for us, we weren't, if we didn't obey God, we weren't going to exist. Mm. Okay. Who said that? Who, where'd that come from? Where'd that come from? You said y'all knew that if y'all didn't obey God, that y'all weren't going to exist. It was our background. Both of our families raised us in the church. And so we knew when God has a plan, uh, we destiny. got to say you could do it the easy way or the hard way. But his plan is going to come to fruition. Okay, And so some of your Bible teaching comes in. <laughs> Uh, just as he promised Abraham, I'm going to give you a son. Yeah. You don't have to uh, advance your position. Okay, just wait. And so, you know, the age, Abraham, uh, 100 years old, and Sarah, uh, depending upon what's the illogical approach you take, 85 or 90 years yep. old. But but God has a plan for him to be glorified. And so, so you either do it the easy way or the hard way. His way. The apostle Paul, when he was Saul, you know, what about threatening the saints? He was a terrible guy. But when his came, his time came on the Damascus Road. And so we because we were steeped and had some knowledge of the word of God, he put in your spirit. So we knew he's got a plan for us. Mm-hmm. Okay. All and- the girlfriends and boyfriends, it wasn't going to work. Not for us. Mm-mm. Okay. And so As a matter of fact, when we first met, I asked him. I oh, yeah, said, this is funny. I said, do you dance? He said, yeah. Yeah, I party, man. I said, do you drink? He said, yeah. Yep. I said, do you, um, I mean, do you know how to have fun? He said, yeah. Well, all the guys that I dated before that was church guys. <laughs> so I said, yes, I'm getting away. Yes, <laughs> I got me one. <laughs> <laughs> Only thing he didn't tell me. He had a calling. No. <laughs> that his mother was in the Church of God in Christ. His grandmother that raised him, helped to raise him, was the church mother at her church. 
He didn't tell me nothing about their religious <laughs> affiliations until I was in love with him. And then I said, okay, God, you got jokes. You got jokes for real. Because then I realized you start putting the pieces together. And when we say go to the family reunion, go find out about all of the people. So you'll know I didn't ask the right question. So God had a sense of humor. He was kind to me. Grandma Linda, you were trying to get away from the church. Ooh, baby, I wanted to be drinking my too, wine too and many, smoking my too cigarettes. Many PKs, too many too many, kids feel the same way. Too many, baby. I wanted to enjoy my life. I said, oh, this going to be a good ride. Yeah. God had a joke. He said, no, it's going to be a holy ride for a, while. for a minute. And then he started tightening and it up. And then he started taking away all my friends. <laughs> I said, really, God? Really? I know. You're not going to have us back to your I'm going to have y'all you know, a whole lot. No, no. I'm going to have gonna y'all say, every day. Y'all going to be uh, a, y'all gonna be a standing, real stuff, man. standing this, guest. Make another, this, I'm I mean, not this joking This is just you. what happened. Okay. This is what has happened to our life. <laughs> We don't stage it. We don't pre-rehearse it. Grandma this Linda, you try, you try to run from the church, and now you done became a whole pastor. But a whole pastor <laughs> with transition homes for battered women, sending kids to college. You didn't want Since, all that in your future, did you? You didn't want to do all that, did you? I had no idea what God had for me. I listen. I wanted to party. I t- didn't. I tell you, I wanted to continue to go to the club, drink my wine, smoke my cigarettes, and hang out with my best guy. Oh God! Well, so so, Grandpa Rod, what did you have in your? What did you believe that you were going to do? Did you even have vision back then? Let me. Let me. He was I, an executive. I was rising through the ranks. Yeah. In corporate America. And I had some people that were mentoring me. Uh, I got to mention just one. Talk about it. Okay. One was Mr. Matthew McNeely. He was the first African-American speaker pro tem of the Michigan House of Representatives. I grew up with his family. Uh, My best friend, uh, Roy, we're frat brothers. We're best friends. And he helped me. He invited me into the political process. And then I met a, a, a gentleman. He became a, a vice president at the company. His name was Dick Whitmer. He is now is the father of the governor of the state of Michigan. He brought me into corporate politics. And then there were others that God put into my life. So I saw an opportunity to work the system. Yeah, to and come they up. were guiding me, and the income I was getting promoted, and you know, building networks. So I just assumed that that's where I was going to go. So let me tell you this, another one of these stories. Honest to God. So, so now I'm happen. working in corporate America, and the Lord calls me to <laughs> preach, and then he calls me to pastor. So while I'm working, making really good money with, with uh, salary and benefits and per- six Linda. figures yeah. in the 90s. Wow. Okay. So I came home one day. He was making day. six figures in the 90s. Oh, you was balling out of control. S- salary, benefits, and perks. My job was about 150 grand. In the 90s? In the 90s. Oh, you were rich, rich. That's a fact. My <laughs> base salary was around 80000 Oh, Jesus Christ, I had, Lord. Uh, have blue, all of that. Thinking and, about it. You, you, you were loving that lifestyle, wasn't you, Grandma Linda? So what? you going to really love this. I came home anointed. And I told her, I said, the spirit of the Lord <laughs> told me to See? quit my job See? and See that? pastor full time. See that? I want somebody in and the audience to say. you know what she told me? Say. You know what this what? preacher's daughter, the sainted woman of God told me? <laughs> what she say? She said, go back and talk to him again. <laughs> I said, God did not tell you that. Okay. Uh-uh. God did not tell you that. Okay. I know That's a that fact. you are hearing from yourself. Because <laughs> God. Want me to be able to shop and travel? What are you talking? I had so many conflicted. You talked about what happened. This kind of foolishness went on in our house. 
Well, he told me, I'm quitting my job. I'm coming home, and I'm going to be a full-time pastor. I said, oh, ho, ho, ho. Oh, ho, 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 ho. How many members you got? <laughs> oh, no. This ain't going to work. So uh-uh. when, you, when you talk about <laughs> adversity. Oh, Jesus. Think about it. She figured mad all over again. <laughs> Listen, we're getting ready to have some intense moments just thinking about it. My first night pastoring. Oh, God. First day. They appointed me that morning. Oh, God. So in the Church of God in Christ, we have evening service. Yeah. Uh-huh. Young People's Wedding Worker, YPWW and yeah. all of that. I came back that evening, <laughs> just know, just knew that all my friends and others who had no church, we go join Griff over there. Yeah. Yeah. There were five people that showed up that evening, and four of them was named Griffin. <laughs> and, and two and was two mad. And two of the four didn't want to be there. <laughs> our son the and daughter. The fifth person they was say, the church mother. Oh, God. Five people. Never will forget that. My oh. son and my daughter, we had left her father's church where all their cousins and friends were. Well, no young people at this church. None. Uh, none. None. Just none. none. So that that uh, that was a lot of conversation. Old pews. <laughs> I came from a beautiful sanctuary. My dad was a bishop in the yeah. church. Beautiful sanctuary to wooden pews <laughs> with kneelers, plastic flowers. Oh, Jesus. I said, oh, Oh, it was just too much. I hate to even think about it. Ask another question. Ask another question. Yeah, yeah this is way too much. How long did Memories. it take? How long did it take you to 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 get on the bandwagon of what the Lord was doing? Who me or him? <laughs> you, we, I started you, pastoring you. in. Uh, how long did it take you to get on? The- it was ninety one. Mm-hmm. Uh, <laughs> 90, 92. 92. Uh-huh. So January right. 92. So she said you remember the month. What the? We kept working <laughs> and working. What did you think? We remodeled the church. Oh, God. We didn't start to see some real growth until 1994. Three years. And now we, we built a church with Vacation Bible School. Yeah. And then the parents started following the yep. kids. <clears throat> That's how you're supposed to do and it. it stayed, but we had taken our 401k money. You know, all of our investment money. <laughs> but wait, but wait, but wait, but wait, but wait. Now but wait, you, there's more. There's You're more. <laughs> I am, I'm not lying. I'm not lying. You can't get this all in your podcast. Oh, it's all in there. People are going to be on the floor. <laughs> Honest to God, I was okay till he told me that God told him we had to sell a house. Oh, God. The first house. That was that was a little later. Yeah, but I said we was okay. And then had the members asking us, so when did you exactly buy this house? As if they yeah, had yeah. bought the yeah, house. With, with, with eight so members. I had to tell them, <laughs> it. we've had it for 20, 21 years we've been here. But the, They thought the, they done bought it. They thought they had bought the house. The house she really gave her the problem this created some more intense moments of fellowship. <laughs> we had a beautiful home in one of the suburban communities of Detroit. Yes. Well, a Deer, uh, was it Dearborn? Where y'all at? Oh, no. Farmington we, Hill. Farmington Hill, boy. That's, that's nice. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. We had oh, a yeah. ranch. It was 5,600 5, square feet. Square feet. 2,800, and then the basement. Was, had a day. Let, let <laughs> me tell you about You tell it. Go ahead, tell it. Had a day spa. <laughs> Had a home theater with risers, with old theater seats. My grandchildren had grand land that they could come down. That we built um, soda, a soda fountain for them at their level, so that they could come and have ice cream and have their burgers and all. Walk-in closet. And a living room downstairs, and then upstairs and I had a, a music room. We had a kitchen. It was so bad. Let me tell. He said, "Sell it." Uh, uh, uh-uh. he came home and said, "We're moving." I said, "He said God told." Me. I said, "There go God again, Jesus." I said, "Really?" He said, "We're selling this, and we're gonna bless God's house, and we're gonna move to an apartment." I said, God, God told you this? He said, God told me this. So when I told you about destiny. Yes, yes. 
You got to be in a place when you love somebody. Yeah. You got to not only love them, but you got to trust them. There it is. I, we sold our home. I I remember going outside on the porch and I was sweeping the, the porch because I wanted the house to be beautiful when the people came to look at it. And this particular, this particular, don't remind me of, of that. <laughs> he said circular drive. <laughs> this particular day, I told God, I said, God, if you send a buyer to buy the house, I'll give you twenty thousand dollars off the top. A third. That's what you th- said. You said that to God. I like, said so, it. So here you are over here, uh, want to bless God. Now, you know you. why? Why? Because I was in God's perfect will. I wasn't in God's perfect will before with my selfish thoughts. <sighs> you know, tell on the devil, shame him. Yeah. And tell on him. Yeah. Because if you love somebody, you got to trust them. Yes. And I trusted that God had told him to sell my dream home. <laughs> Where's the camera? Right there. Oh, to sell my dream home <laughs> and go into an apartment. That's what I had to trust this man for. <laughs> the day I told God that, that next day, God sent the buyer. But listen at this. We're at the closing table, and he and I are sitting there, and the washing machine had broke maybe the couple of days before closing. And we're so principled that we went and bought a new washing machine for the new people, Good the new buyers. Yes. Because whatever way you do a thing, it's going to follow you. So we were presenting that to them at the closing table. And our realtor was like really outraged. She said, you didn't have to do that. But we did have to do it because we were principled and we, <clears throat> everything in the house worked. Yes. Except that. Yeah. So we wanted to present them with this gift. But let me tell you what God had done. Teach. Right before we found the house and bought the house that God allowed me to love and enjoy, an Italian family, husband and wife, had came the day before we saw it and the day before we put the bid in. But the Italian husband and wife that came, the husband that night went and had a heart attack and died. True story. Left her as a widow. True story. She loved the house. She cried over it. But she didn't want to get the house because her husband had made his transition. They were wealthy. They could afford it. But he had made his transition. We came. We found it. We loved it. God allowed me to stay in that house for, say, four years. Then it was time for us to move on. That was the family that was at the closing table. Brought their mother, and we all looked at each other, and we said, we remember you. and you." Her son and daughter, we told them if we would have known it was your mother, we would have never used a real estate agent. We, we could have done this. this. Okay. Just us. But what happened wow. as a result of that, God used that experience to let us know this, all of this is temporary. I try to tell people, Grandma Linda. Yeah, yeah. this is I all temporary. Don't told, hold on to it. He no. told us real clear, I got you this house. And then the cattle on a thousand hills. I mean, he let us know I got it all. Talk about it. Yeah. yeah. And we took, we took money and rebuilt the church. And then we get went into a miraculous kind of building program. We doubled the size of the church. We had a whole new wing built. Yeah. And uh, that was another time that we were counting pennies, but God just blessed us and blessed us. Yeah. Bishop shared. Well, well, let, me Go tell, ahead. let me tell them about the house because mm-hmm. women got to know this. Anything that God takes from you. Come on. All you got to do is wait on him, depend on him, and trust him. He took my 5,600-square-foot home, and because I willingly did it, somewhat willingly, (laughs) somewhat, 
He <laughs> built me a home from the ground up. Talk about it. And we're in the woods. Yes. Where nothing but the deer and the antelope <laughs> literally roam. <laughs> Wild turkeys. But the house is second to none. Yeah. He did that because of the spirit in which I had to give up the home of my dreams. So he had God had something better for me yes. as a result of giving up that house. He had another house. And the best is yet to come. I Let me tell you wait. something. People need to hear what y'all just said. That was so powerful. Because that's how God treats us. Mm -mm. He says, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, then all these things shall be added. When you look at cars, that's a thing. When you look at houses, it's a thing. When you look at nice shopping sprees that you want to go, it's just things. Mm -hmm. But God says, you tell me that you're willing to hold on to this. This is little bit. Do you know who your daddy is? Like you said, I'm a father that owns a cow on a thousand hills. So why are you worrying about this little trivial little house? That's nothing. You want this 5,600? You said 56? 5,600. 5,600 square foot house. Mm -hmm. I got 10,000 for you. I got this. I got a custom home bill. It's not about the size of the house. It's about the size of your obedience. Absolutely. That's it. That's it. You got it. it exactly right. That's it. Those are, those are some of the trials and tribulations and the tests. But you see, as we talked earlier about the respect and trust that we have for each other, then your absolute confidence in God grows the same way. Mm -hmm. okay. Yes. Now, I, I, when I talked about my cancer and her her broken uh, ankle. Yes, I've preached for years. She's got a she's got a plate, a steel plate mm. with eleven titanium screws to hold her ankle together. Oh wow! Okay, that's my right now. Ankle and my foot okay. separated. Yeah. So, but here's the deal. That's crazy. I've preached that God is a healer, mm -hmm. but I don't have to just preach it. Can testify now, cause I know He's a healer. Talk mm -hmm. about it. Okay. And so your ministry changes, your personality changes, your dependency changes, your relationship with God changes. Mm -hmm. And all of those things, uh, even now, uh, I'm going to be retiring from pastoring, but not from ministry. Because even it. what we're doing now, this is no coincidence. It's not. It started with something very simple, but we're going to continue to reach out to let people know you can love light. Get beyond the hopelessness of it. Get beyond the defeat of it. Uh, I tell people, and you can use this everywhere you go, and uh, it's not copyrighted. Uh, you've already bought me breakfast and paid for me to get here, so that <laughs> covers it. You can tell people this. You can use this. You can sign off if you want to. God told me to share with people, count your blessings, but never your disappointments. Now let that marinate. Count your blessings, but never your disappointments. Because the enemy will ride in on every disappointment you have and make you feel like you will never, ever be able to accomplish anything. Okay? okay. And so folk who have, for, you know, I, I stopped praying for a large church mm -hmm. because the, the Lord said little is much with me. So... I have a, a, our slogan is we can do mega ministry without being a mega church. Yes. We have, I give you an example. This, ain't, this is my boasts in the Lord. We've been doing this for years, but I'll just take you what we did this past uh, summer. We have a, a back to school rally. My church, the church where I pastor, Rosa Sharon Church of God in Christ, we have maybe 100 members now, but we had a back to school rally that we gave out 400 book bags filled with school supplies. Yes. Mm -hmm. We had a health fair. Mm -hmm. We gave away gun locks and COVID kits. Arbor. And then we had one of our sons of the church, more like a grandson, mm -hmm. who has his own barber business, brought his portable barber shop, a trailer, Close and started to his cutting business. the little boys' head. One of our elders at the church joined in. You had to see mm. the hand those of God. Mothers mm. that brought their sons and got these haircuts. What am I saying? I'm saying that here's what God will do when you put it in his hands and trust him. Yes. With with barely a hundred members, this is how we're able to bless people. 
and we and we did the same thing with trunk or treat, uh, and then we've done the same thing with uh, Thanksgiving and Christmas. Uh, we've given out between Thanksgiving and Christmas over 200 turkeys and 50, 60 boxes of food that were donated to us. We've become a conduit. We have blessed people to get mortgages. We've done we've done uh, scholarships. We've we've been a conduit we for grants. We had a transition and, ministry where we had five of them houses that we furnished from the bottom to the top with all of the technology that the children would need to do their homework, to get good grades. But let me tell you, the mothers, single moms, lived in the home for 18 months free. No rent. No utilities. No utilities, no nothing. We told them to save their money so they can buy the house. And they would buy the homes at the end of it, but I would go to the model homes the people that had model homes, and I'd talk with the manager, the leasing manager, and I'd give get them to give me the furniture in the homes so that I could furnish the transition homes. And one, the first home I did, the lady said, well, how much do you want to give me? I said, donation, please, thank you. She said, no, 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 we can't donate it. I said, I'm going to pray, and you're going to donate. And I ended up spending, I think, a couple $300 for a house full of furniture, bedrooms, living rooms, dining room, kitchen, all of the stuff that they would need to get them started. So when you do it God's way, he takes the physical part of your brain and he rewires it to a spiritual part. Oh, God. And he takes the mo- desire that you have for you, and he transfers it to God's people. And so when you talk about love and relationships, if you put God first, your desires would be in pleasing him. Not him. But if you please him, Everything else falls in line. Your love life would be great. I tell people this. Who I am bless guaranteed me. to be a success. Mm-hmm. And when people say, well, why you say that? I say because when I'm in God's perfect will, mm-hmm. when I do exactly what the Lord tells me to do, he won't let me fail because it's what he wants me to do. Yes. And God, there's no failure in him. No. And so... Look at this now. I, back during the pandemic, mm-hmm. when we uh, were told that we had to shut the church down, and I'm you know, a little militant, I said, well, the federal government ain't going to tell me I'm going to keep the doors of this church open. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay. And that's that. I said that on the air. Yeah. I said that during the live stream. I'm going to do this. So y'all might as well, I'll be waiting for you when you come to the front door. Yeah. The very next day, mm-hmm. the Lord spoke to me and said, now, you're going to be responsible for those that get to COVID. You're going to heal them. Mm-hmm. Okay. Because what you just said does not glorify me. Mm-hmm. Okay, So I shut the church down. My son, Hunter's dad, had been telling me for years, do Facebook Live. And I, I don't be bothered with that. Yeah, I started that, and we started reaching people. That you've never reached before? Mm-hmm. Never. And when you open so, back up, there they go. So where, where all of this is, is an extension. Mm-hmm. Now we're reaching people all over the world. Yep. And I've told the church, he gave me to take this ministry outside of the four walls. There it is. So I'm, I'm training someone to replace me and, and her as a first lady because there is a pent-up desire. People want to know how you're able to do this. Yeah. And I got to give, we got to, we have to give them the practical approach. But I, just, I don't know where I got this saying from, but you can use this one too. Without God, we can't. And without us, God won't. You got that? Okay. Write it down. Without God, we can't. We can't. And without us, us God won't. God won't. Mm-hmm. Okay. So where we are, we're at perfect peace. With okay. each other and with God. And we know we're blessed people. We're excited about it. 
<laughs> one of the things I'm going to do as we get ready to close, I'm going to drop a link to y'all's church. Um, to y'all, y'all have a website? Oh, I'm sorry. Y'all have a website? Yes. Okay, I'll get it from uh, Hunter. Right. I'm going to put y'all website so people, if they want to give some tithes and offering, then they, I'm, I'm, I'm a, I want y'all to blow their mind. You see, so I listen to people. I see how they steward. They're good stewards over uh, the things of God and all these programs that they got going on, all the stuff that they're doing to help and shape and change the community. I want them to see how the Dear Future Wifey podcast supporters we call them the lit fam uh the lit fam comes together and we converge on stuff and they're going to blow your mind watch it watch it roll through uh before we conclude this you have been gifted and anointed the bible says that people overcome by the word of your testimony and by the blood of the lamb that's the bible you have set cancer you kicked it out you know what I'm saying? You 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 told cancer it got to go. Uh, your faith didn't fail. I want you to, and I had a conversation with um, a daughter whose father and mother are battling cancer just yesterday. Had a powerful conversation, and this Friday they'll be going to the doctor to find a diagnosis. Um, wow, God is just so omniscient. Like, I, I never knew that you... Uh, it's so much stuff that y'all said in this. You're talking about I'm triggering y'all by bringing up stuff and all that. Y'all have been confirming stuff left and right. Y'all are the... You heard me say that this is my personal journey. Um, certain guests represent my past. Some guests represent my present. And some people represent my future. Y'all represent my future. Y'all represent what 51 years of unfailing love looks like. Y'all represent what it looks like when you face adversity, but you say we're committed to the pur to the purpose, that we are indeed purpose partners. Y'all represent what it looks like to have a feisty uh, uh, purpose partner as my wife that says, hold on, don't sell the house, but I trust you. <laughs> don't do this, but I trust you. <laughs> People got mad at me. Some people didn't agree with this this video I did in the first season where I said, what's greater than love to me is trust. Yeah. And then y'all came, you came and said, no, trust. Because at the end of the day, we say we love a whole lot of people and divorce them. We say we love people at a, at a concert, the the rap artists, the R&B artists be like, love y'all, don't know your name. Right. But they throw love around so frivolously. But trust that withstands the test of time. No question. No question. Yeah. And so people are like, now nah, the Bible says the grace of these things is love. I understand that's what comes after, but you got to get some trust before you ever get to love. But you won't even get to love, really unconditional love, that, that 1 Corinthians 13 kind of love. You won't even get that if you don't trust that person. Cannot. You don't trust them with your secrets. You don't trust them with access to your money. You don't trust them with your heart. You don't trust them with your insecurities. You don't trust them with your fears. But then you say, but I love you. We say it all the time. Kiss, make love to the person, but never, ever trust them. So I want you to speak into that camera to those who are battling cancer, and I want you to speak a word in their life, and I want you to pray over them right now, if you would, please, man of God. In, I'm going to give you the short version, and then we're going to pray. In... April of 2021, there was a lump on the side of my face. I found it. I went to the dentist because I thought it had something to do with a dental problem. They said not. I went to, I'm a VA, I'm a veteran. I went to the VA. They identified it. They thought it was benign. After the surgery, which was supposed to only last two to three hours, it lasted nearly four hours. I, I was so in tune with what was happening when they cut the tumor out, the flesh, the diseased tumor, I asked them, let my wife take a picture of it because I, I knew that God was setting me up for something. They, did, they, announced it, they announced it as malignant. And before they came back with the pathologist report, my wife said, honey, it ain't going to be good. So once I understood it, I also understood that God was going to use me, yes. not unlike he used Job. I believed that the enemy said, you've blessed Ronald, Larry, Griffin, and Linda. Put something on them, and they'll turn their back on you. Okay? Yes. It drew me closer to him because I realized third stage goes into fourth stage, and I know people that leave here just like that. So I trusted God. I trusted him. And so what I want to say to you is this. It doesn't matter what man says. 
He can diagnose because God gave him the mind to do that. And he could give you a prognosis. He could tell you it ain't never going to come back or you got six months to live. Let me tell you something. I've seen testimonies. One of our adopted daughter's mother takes chemotherapy and radiation. She's just two years younger than I am. And she has battled with cancer for the last two, two and a three half years. years. Mm-hmm. And she's still standing. We had another member of our church who passed away, but he had cancer for 20, 20 years. years. Don't focus. I want you to focus. Everyone out there today that has cancer or any debilitating disease, yes. don't focus on what medical science has said. I, I, I allowed medical science to use me because we have too many of our people, black people who become superstitious. If you recall, we didn't even want to take COVID shots because we believed in conspiracies. Yeah, I wanted people to know it was a combination of medical science, but my faith in God. And I've already declared whatever other condition I have in my body, I'm never going to use medical science again. It's just going to be me and God. Teach. I don't, I don't need a middleman. And I want to encourage you today, have no pity party. Don't surround yourself with folk with negativity. You got to believe mm-hmm. just as sure as medical science says you got a malignancy in your body. You got to be assured that God is able and he's willing and able. It's not can he do it, it's will he do it. You got to believe that and watch the quality of your life improve. I promise you, I brought two copies of the book. I took all the proceeds, Amazon, it's on Amazon, they, they said it was nineteen ninety nine. I took all of the proceeds and gave them to our foundation. I didn't take a dime for myself, but I brought two copies. I'm gonna leave a copy here and to the couple that you're talking about, I want them to read about my journey. Yes. Now, in the name of Jesus, hallelujah, dear Lord, yes. you brought this together. Yes, God. Yes, this God. is no coincidence. Yes. This God. is your divine will. Yes, yes, God. You've used social media for what you intended it to be used for. Yes, God. So they can reach outside of the four walls of hallelujah. our local churches hallelujah. and reach people all over the world. Yes, God. The people who have become disenchanted, who yes, feel hopeless God. and helpless. Yes, God. Oh, God, they don't believe you're the God of our salvation yes. because others have taken all that you represent and distorted it with a focus on materialistic things and yes, positions and titles. But God, yes. Yes, God, in the name of Jesus, in the name of touch Jesus. the sick and the afflicted now. Right now, touch God. the couple that He's talking about. Yes, God. encourage their heart. Yes, lift yes. them up, oh God. Yes, God, and we'll thank you. And when the people ask in the days to come, when they ask, how are you able to make it? How were you able to go through the surgery? Yes, God. How were you able to withstand 33 radiation treatments? Yes, How God. were you able to withstand no eating and no drinking of nutritious uh, beverages? How were you able to yes, do God. it? How were you able to shrink down to a size that you hadn't had in 30 or 40 years yes. and then be built back up? How were you able to still stand? And we're going to mm-hmm. testify. We'll make known your deeds yes, among God. the people. We'll lift your name up. Yes. Now touch, oh God. Yes, touch God. all those that are losing hope and encourage their heart. Bless yes. their households. God. Bless the families. Bless the generations, oh God. Yes. In the name of Jesus. Yes. And bless, oh God, this ministry. In yes, the God. name of Jesus. In the name bless, of Jesus. Bless, oh God, this attempt to reach God's people. Yes. Bless, oh God, this man servant that you have touched and anointed with these gifts. I ask you that you would open doors for him that are now closed. Make a way out of no way where no way exists. Do it such in a supernatural way that he can't do anything but give your name. All of the praises, all of the honor, and all of the glory. Yes, and when God. people ask in the days to come, yes, how are you able to make it? I promise you, oh God, we'll testify to your goodness. We'll do it. We'll do it, dear Lord. You can trust us to do it. Yes. And we thank you now. In Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, thank God. Heavenly Father, Heavenly Father, I want to pray for 
those uh, women that may be battling with endometriosis. Yes, we come against that right now in the yes, name of Lord. Jesus, yes, God. Lord. I speak healing over them oh, from the crown God. of their heads Do to the it, soles Lord. of their feet. You said it's not by power nor by nor might, but by, by thy might. spirit, saith the Lord. Yes, so, Lord, let your spirit visit them right now in yes. the name of Jesus. Yes, let God. your healing power take place right yes, now God. in the name of Jesus. People that are dealing with, with, with illnesses and diseases that, that the doctors have given them like they make them feel like they're so hopeless but god we have to look to the hills for which cometh our help because our help cometh from you god let us lean not to our own understanding but in all our ways acknowledge you and allow you to direct our paths the paths to healing the path of peace the path of grace the path of joy yes. lord the path of restoration the yes. path of redemption god we just lay it all on the altar before you you said cast all our cares on you because you care for us God, we're going to do exactly that. We're casting our cares on you. Yes. And we'll continue to give you the praise, the glory, and the adoration. God, I thank you for the Griffins. I thank you for the anointing that is over their lives, the mantle that you have bestowed upon them. God, I just, I ask that you bless them. Bless the yes. work of their hands. Yes. Bless them. Let everything they touch prosper, God. Even when they touch each other, let let, let them just send prosperous, uh, uh, prosperous moments to each other, God, just in the touch. Let yes. in, Even the anointed embrace. Yes. that grandma Linda has when she hugs. She don't give you some little quick hug. She gives you a nice, attentive, intentional hug, a restorative hug. And we thank you right now in the name of Jesus. Continue to anoint the work of their hands. In Jesus' name we pray. Thank Amen. God. Thank God. You know, y'all, um, thank y'all. Thank you. What do y'all feel in this moment? What do y'all feel in this moment as we wrap up? I was, I f I'm overwhelmed. And I wanted to say that I'm praying for every woman that's out there that has a broken heart, mm. that God will heal the heart, heal the heart, and give her a reason to look forward to happiness. Yes, look forward and to happiness. Every disappointment, I'm asking that God will erase it because there's hope after the hurt. Yes. You can never help anybody if you don't know what that feels like. I am, um, my concern is for families and what I have taught for for 30 years, I've been a pastor. When black men get delivered, black women are automatically, automatically. blessed. Because we'll then take care of our families, our sons, mm -hmm. our daughters, our mothers, our fathers. So my prayer is for all my brothers, self-examine. Let's check ourselves and realize we're so much greater than we allow ourselves to be. Yes. And you got to know that the master plan of the enemy is made manifest because when he destroys families, he destroys the church because families are comprised, churches are comprised of families. Yeah. So man is taken from an everyday brother that was in the streets committing adultery, chasing women, getting all the stuff. Yeah. And there was a great man, a professional basketball player, uh, that once said he's a big guy, 6'8", uh, weighed about 300 pounds at the time, uh, put his arm around me in front of a whole lot of people and said, if God can take Ron Griffin off the streets, there's hope for us all. Bob <laughs> I just want you to know that what we shared with you is our lives. We ain't boasting in the ungodly things mm -mm. we do, but we don't have a shame. Yeah. Because God, we allowed him to come into our lives. Get away from being concerned about all the trappings. Don't you let what you've seen, and y'all have to forgive me, but uh, uh, I got to say it, baby, because it's me. Don't get contaminated by put pimps in the pulpit. Don't do that. because and, and all of those in the pulpit, there's a whole lot of men and women out there serving God for real. You don't hear about them because they're in the trenches every day. Yes. They're doing stuff every day. 
find you a ministry, a church home yeah. that you know is for real, and then work, use the gifts and talents and skills. And, and let me just tell you this. Stop glorifying man. Yeah. Okay. I don't allow the men at my church to, they want to carry, man, I'm, I can still carry stuff. <laughs> they say, Pastor, you, you had an age, now let us do stuff. Uh-uh. But if nothing more, I'm going to walk with them. If they tell me I can't cut the grass, I'll walk with them while they're cutting it mm, because I refuse hard. to let them. I clean hard. bathrooms and toilets. Brothers, the destiny is ours. And so my concern, a black man like you, I want you to continue to do what you do. And you might as well know now you're part of this family. Mm-hmm. Okay. And so we'll be checking on you. Good. And I know Good how to find man. you. <laughs> so if I get a if I get a report that you done got crazy. <laughs> we know how to get on a plane. Okay. We love to fly. This has been beautiful. Hey, y'all this got fab- no y'all got family up here. It's not. Okay. It's, it's not. Be. It's not. It's 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 so God. It's so God. Yeah. It is so God. And I'm just excited about how intentional this episode is and was based on the episode that I released. When y'all watched that episode that I released last week, yeah. uh, y'all gonna say, wow, how he go from that moment to this moment? What in the world is God doing? Sure. But God is a God of restoration. Appreciate you, sir. Thank you. Y'all give it up for my people, Grandma Linda and Grandpa Ronald. Ladarian thrusted suddenly into Child Protective Services in 2015. My nephew, black, a boy. The likelihood of being adopted outside of kinship, slim to none. Armani, 16 years old, black, a boy, with five years in the foster care system before I even knew his name. The likelihood of ever being adopted, yep, you guessed it, slim to none. While Ladarian and Armani were trying to survive and barely thrive in an overpopulated and underfunded foster care system, I was living my own life, doing well professionally. Having been a single father with a daughter who at that point was doing well in college, it was my time to live my life, right? Wrong. I felt unsettled, tireless, agitated. There are just too many of our black children stuck in ambiguity and in the limbo of the foster care system. In 2017, I legally adopted my nephew, Ladarian. Fast forward to 2019, I had no ties to this other young king, but I felt God instructed me to adopt him also, and I obeyed. Starting over with parenting should have been enough, right? Working with various foster care and adoption agencies to help bring awareness to the countless young black kings in the foster care system should have decreased my agitation, right? Joining the board of directors of Advantage Adoption, an organization that helps find permanent adoptive homes for children in foster care, should have led to some type of resolve, right? No, not at all. None of it felt like I had done enough. I now realize that every one of those experiences was laying the fundamental foundation for my life's mission, Kingdom Royale. Kingdom Royale will be a luxury, state-of-the-art home for foster boys. Our first location will be in the Dallas-Fort Worth Metroplex. We will utilize the whole person approach that instills identity, empowers them to advocate for themselves, and enlightens them regarding new perspectives and limitless options that they thought were impossible. Though the young kings will attend the local public schools that are in proximity to Kingdom Royale, Our at-home curriculum will broaden their worldview through participating in the arts, attending various cultural events, learning about and engaging in multifaceted discussions about current events and even relevant historical context, introducing them to gardening and landscaping and even caring for our animals on our farm and on-site stables. We just launched our startup capital campaign with the goal of raising $2.8 million. Now, why $2.8 million? Well, in 2017, I created a web series in which I performed random acts of kindness for targeting the homeless community. One of the most notable successes was that one of the videos went viral, garnering 28 million views. However, one of my biggest regrets is that I didn't raise a single dollar to help in implementing a more sustainable plan for the homeless community. So throughout the years, with much remorse, 
I reflected on not maximizing that moment. I knew if at that time, just 10% of the viewers donated $1, we would have raised at least $2.8 million that could have really established long-term support for the homeless community, or at least started a long-term initiative to do so. This is my do-over. This is our new beginning. Together, we can attack this at the root by specifically helping our homeless black boys who are already disproportionately represented in the American foster care system. I'm LaTerris R. Whitfield. I've been nominated for three regional Emmys documenting my work with the homeless as well as my personal adoption journey. Despite those accolades, the greatest award for me is truly providing the infrastructure for a transformed life. Visit KingdomRoyale.com for more details. Crown a king and make a donation today. You wouldn't imagine how much I enjoy sitting at the feet of wisdom. This was such the perfect, it was, it was a perfect episode to backdoor the episode that I did last week. Such a healing episode. An episode that shows me what I desire, what I long for, is attainable. So God in his omniscience, his all-knowingness, orchestrated them being on the podcast, knowing that I would experience heartbreak, and I'm just so indebted to God, so indebted to God. Shout out to the Griffins. You minister to my heart. You minister to my soul. I feel seen by God from this episode. Well, here's my favorite part of the podcast where I speak to my future wifey. <sighs> Thank you, Lord. Dear future wifey, decades will pass and feel like a day. Gray hairs will replace the black ones, but our love remains the same. This is unfailing love. We will rise above adversity. We recommit to one another in times of dissension. We will create a safe space in our home and cultivate an environment where we thrive, where the foundation is a springboard to propel us into our greatest versions. We will experience oneness. We will experience a depth in the Lord that confirms his omniscience. We will experience unconditional love your future hubby. I hope you enjoyed this episode of the Dear Future Wifey podcast. Remember, be lit, live intentionally and transparently, and don't stop loving. Make sure to subscribe to our Dear Future Wifey YouTube channel. We're available on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, and Stitcher. We welcome your support. Simply share our podcast with your friends and family.